tool and some thinking around how we can get off this vicious cycle of being out of control, struggling with overwhelm and, and potentially failing at the important things in our life. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm sitting and where you may be sitting. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who might be listening right now. More importantly, I'd like to acknowledge the role of traditional owners and Indigenous people of Australia as the first knowledge creators and their very deep understanding of the land, the sea and the sky forms. All right. Day five. Hey, travelling. Um, <clears throat> I'd love to hear any comments around anything that you've been trying or anything that you've been doing over the last, um, you know, five days. What, what has worked, what hasn't, what's something that's been able to stick with you. Um, I'd love to, if, so if you've, if you've been here for the whole journey, whack something in the comments for me so I can have a, have a, a look at what you've been um, working on. And just as a recap uh, for anyone who might be just coming today for the first time, um, on day one, we talked about the need to stop and to make time or a buffer in our world that allows us just to have some thinking space and breathing space so we can show up as our best selves um, in whatever context we need to. Um, and we talked about on that day, I talked about just literally blocking time out in your diary. Uh, my book that's coming out uh, in January next year is called The 15% Rule and it actually does talk about exactly that, where we need to create 15% of space or buffers in our world so that we have the opportunity to react positively as opposed to stressfully uh, when change is upon us or new things happen. And so that was our first day. And the uh, challenge was, could you block some time out just where you are able to do whatever you want? where you can stop and think, uh, process, whatever you need to do. Um, and the thing we love about that time and the analogy that we drew was it's, uh, it's a bit like when someone cancels a meeting unexpectedly and that joyful feeling when you look at your diary and go, yes, a whole hour to myself or, or even a whole day might have been cancelled for some reason. You go, yay, a whole day to myself. What would you do on those days? You'd probably catch up on a bit of backlog, yeah? What I found is that over time, when people consistently block out time to do what they need to do, over time, their horizon line changes from catching up on stuff to then working on what I need to today, then eventually we begin to use that time for the future. And so instead of thinking, gee, I've got to catch up on a bunch of stuff, we're, we're starting to look further out and going, right, what could I be working on now that's, that's going to help me in the future? Or as I like to say, that your future self will thank you for. So that's what we did, talked about on day one, this notion of needing to block some time out. On day two, we talked about taking stock. And so we had to look at what's going on in our world. And dealing with overwhelm is often because we carry too much stuff in our heads. And I still can't remember who the refer reference was, but I should find it because it's a good one, that said that the brain was never meant for storing ideas. It was meant for creating ideas. And so having a place where we can get rid of this stuff out of our head becomes really important. Now, there was no specific tool for this one, uh, but simply something like um, a piece of paper where you do a brain dump each morning and you just dump everything you need to do so that it's out of your head. Now, there's a couple of great reasons for this. First of all, now it's accessible to you. Um, and secondly, it's like dusting, dusting cobwebs out of your head. It means that you're able to um, clear your brain for, for processing other things. As my friend Len Kazali says, if we think of our brain like a dump truck, we, can, we can't keep overfilling it. Things will just keep falling out, which is why we become forgetful and why we be, become uh, at risk of failing at the important things. And so we've got to, from time to time, empty out the dump truck. And so wiping the mind or doing a brain dump of everything you've got is really important. So that's what we talked about on day two. On day three... We started to make some decisions around priorities and there was a couple of tools that I shared with you on day two. Uh, so we talked about you doing a personal Kanban, which is basically um, assorting all your things that you need to do according to uh, you really um, some priorities. So it was things, so we, we had a, a whiteboard or a setup, um, maybe it could be on your wall or whatever, <clears throat> where we have all the things we need to do in one column called to do, just a big long list. Then we have a column called in progress. 
And you'll do this more successfully if you only have three to five things in the um, in progress. So we don't want to be overfilling it. That's what creates the overwhelm when we feel like we've got so much that we're working on. And so we might only have three to five things in there because I know we can, you know, we're often waiting on information. So we can work on two or three at least things at once. So I'd say no more than three to five. And then a third column called completed where you move things to once they're done. And that's because we're leveraging the, this idea, this, this motivational idea from Dr. Jason Fox that uh, making progress visible helps us feel more motivated when we can see how much we've done. Now, I'm going to just add a little bit to that today because I think sometimes our to-do, that it's overwhelming that there's so much in there. So I'd love you to have columns maybe before that that are to-do but not for another three months or another six months. So I remember one of the things that I did at one point was I did have a lot on, and I'm an ideas person. I'm always coming up with new and amazing ideas, and I really should do this, and books I want to write, and all sorts of stuff. And so I set up myself a spreadsheet, a planner over quarters, and any time I had an idea, I would move it to a quarter where there was space. And that meant, for example, the book that I'm writing right now, that had been put off for about 12 months because I had other things that I needed to do, and now it's hit the quarter for that book. And so spreading things out over time can be really useful. And I also think for those of you who work in organisations, it's a great conversation to have with your uh, manager or leader around, here's all the stuff we've got going on. I think we need to schedule when this stuff happens so people can keep on track of things rather than having this massive pile of things we want to do. So that was one of the tools, thinking using Kanban uh, methodology. And the other tool I talked about was me or not me which was really delegation in disguise, just quietly. Um, and so really it is in any of those tasks that are in your to-do list, can someone else, does it have to be you or could it be not you? Um, could someone else be doing those? And so there were some tools in there around identifying um, or, or what tool, what, what um, task should be mine. Things like, um, you know, if it's a leadership thing, it's very strategic, it has to be you. If it's... Um, giving, you know, developmental feedback or um, encouraging feedback to your staff, that really should be you. But things that are repetitive, that are done over and over again, report writing, even attending regular WIP meetings, they could be some of the things you could get other people to do for you. So that's a really great thing to think about is around, is, it, is this me or could it be not me in terms of how we think about our tasks? And then uh, yesterday, what did we talk about yesterday? Um, we talked about starting to design, uh, sorry, define, define what we think is important. We're doing design today. We started to define what was important. And the tool I shared with you is one that came from uh, writer Carol's book, uh, the, um, uh, oh, it's sitting right up here. What's it called? The bullet journal method, of course, the bullet journal method. And it was called the 54321 tool. And this one asks you to project out in both your professional and your personal lives What's something you want to achieve five years from now? And in order to, and maybe two or three things you'd like to achieve in both aspects of your personal and professional life. And then what might be um, some things you need to get done in the next four quarters uh, to achieve those? And then the next three months, then the next two weeks, and then the next one day. And what this does is it, is it creates a sense of purpose around why we're doing what we're doing. And, you know, it wasn't an excuse if we, there's stuff we don't like to not do it. It's really just around, at least if we've got jobs we don't really like doing. So I've got to tell you, I don't really like doing anything to do with financials, just quietly. Um, so I try to outsource that to people who are better at it than me, but occasionally I have to do it. Um, and it isn't that um, I put it off because it's, you know, it's unhappy or not doesn't help me or not. But what I do is I find purpose in that work because I know it's leading me to an ultimate goal. And so we're leveraging again from Dr. Jason Fox, who said the two things that create motivation are purpose and progress. And so laying out a map for what I want to, where I want to be in five years helps me work over the next four quarters, helps me work over the next three months, helps me focus over the next two weeks and makes it clear on what I should be doing on a daily basis in terms of my tasks. So excellent tool for that. Now, Today, I want to talk about designing your best day or even week. It really depends on how you use this. And so you would probably know if you don't, uh, you're finding out here first. I wrote a book uh, called The First Two Hours, uh, best-selling book, 
Um, and it talks about the benefits of energy and so how we um, really, in a nutshell, it's more about when we do things rather than what we do. And so let me just share a little bit about what I mean by that. So if we think about um, intensity as some, is, is, is our brain power, how much brain power do we have or how much brain power do we need? And some tasks require high intensity and some require low intensity. So this is around, you know, high intensity means my brains need to be on, it's my smarts, it's when I'm doing my sharpest work. Low intensity is when I can probably be a little bit in autopilot. And the other aspect of the work I like us to think about is, is around return on investment. And so there are some things that when I invest my time in it, have a high impact. Things that have a really high impact on my world and other things that have a lower impact. I'm not going to say that it's low impact and it's not relevant, but it really is about, you know, things that are less important to me. So it could be if you're a manager or leader, often these are the things that you spend your time with people um, that, that it might be high impactful for them and they need your smarts, um, but it may not necessarily be as impactful for you. And so if we think about this as a clock, um, obviously when our brain is at our best and, and the research shows us that um, our body clocks are at its best uh, for, for thinking in the mornings, we've got higher levels of mental agility in the mornings. Um, not so apparent right now as I've been a bit forgetful, but allegedly we have higher mental agility in the mornings and we have better physical dexterity in the afternoons. And so what we want to do is why wouldn't we do the work that requires our, our brains to be on and that's the most impactful, best return on our investment first up. So we have the first two hours, second two hours, third two hours and fourth two hours. So in a nutshell, that's how this book came about. So in the first two hours, we do stuff that's high intensity and low impact, uh, and sorry, and high impact, the stuff that's really important for us that, that will, you know, if you think about what your future self will thank you for, getting on top of all that stuff. Now, can I suggest, this is a direct down the camera moment, can I suggest that it might be good to block out your two hours for that, but I'd also be blocking out an hour either side, maybe if I could, to do my thinking space. So I know this feels like you're blocking out an awful lot of time here, but you kind of are. That's what you're paid to do. We're knowledge workers. I don't think there's anyone who'd be listening today, that, and not that there's anything wrong with this, it's a different career choice, that you're uh, out being a carpenter or something like that. You're out manual labor, making things. M most of the people that are in my world are knowledge workers and we are paid for our smarts. And so we need to protect time for thinking. And so whether that's creating space to just wipe the mind, creating space, for, which is the best time of day for us to do some really great thinking and, and get on top of the really important things before we then dive into the rest of the day. So I do know people that set aside the first two hours from about 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. for them to do their stuff, their thinking, their, their best work, so that then from 9 o'clock when the rest of the world clocks on, they are able to respond to them. I don't mind how you do this and I'm not going to be the first two hours police. You can figure out the best way for you to do that. But what I'm really wanting to say is I want you to be thoughtful and mindful and design your days. So we start our days with our most important work that requires um, brains, brain power, excuse me. <coughs> Still got a bit of a cough. <coughs> mm. Unattractive, sorry. Uh, the stuff that requires our, our best thinking and then uh, that has the best return on our investment. Then the second two hours, our brain's still on because it's still the morning. Let's say it's from about 11 or 10 till 12 or 11 till 1. Uh, we're able to give our thinking our best stuff, our genius. We're able to share that with others. So that's when you do do meetings with your team, your staff, etc. The third two hours is typically after lunch and we do have an energetic lull at that time. So really good to do any process work. So I suggest this is the time where you do tidy up your inbox or go for a walk or do the kinds of repetitive routine stuff that if you haven't yet uh, given it to someone else to do, see previous um, me or not me um, tool, that you're, um, yeah, that's the time when you would do that. Uh, the thing that I find about the third two hours is a lot of people waste that time because they're trying to do things that need a bit of brain power and they end up making mistakes, uh, doing it over and over again, or having that feeling of, you know, when you're tired and you're trying to read something and you end up reading the same paragraph over and over and over because your brain's just not on for that. 
So you've got to do the kind of things in the third two hours. It doesn't really need your smarts to be switched on. And then the fourth two hours, which is actually my favourite, and I think this is the place to start. If you're already in a place of overwhelm, this is the place where it's high impact, so it can have a big impact in terms of time, but it doesn't need a lot of brain power. So what I do in the last two hours of the day or the fourth two hours, or at the very least I try and do an hour of power at the end of each day, where I wrap up everything that I've done, just a big, quick review, how have I gone today, have I got the things that I wanted to do, Think about the things that I want to get done in the two hours the next day. So, you know, flip over the page and start my next day's to-dos. And it always starts with things that are going to be my high impact um, and high intensity tasks. And then I'll have a few others that I'll spread throughout the other parts of the day. Then I'll think about things like, what am I going to wear tomorrow? What am I going to eat tomorrow? What are some of the things that I can make decisions about now that'll just clear up space tomorrow morning? And remember, your future self will thank you. So when you get up in the morning, you've already got your wardrobe sorted. You don't have to think about that. You've already got your breakfast thought about. If you're traveling somewhere, if you're out of lockdown and you're traveling somewhere, you've got your route already um, planned out. You've already the night before looked at the meetings uh, that you have the next day and you've done whatever prep you can do. But here's the really good thing. What you've also done is pop popped into your unconscious mind the meetings you have the next day, and it'll begin to unconsciously prepare for that. So if you already think about, here's the three meetings, here's the things I need to have my smarts switched on for tomorrow, it'll start processing that in your unconscious for you as you sleep. And so these are the reasons why this fourth two hours is actually my favourite. And I know I wrote the book the first two hours, but it's the fourth two hours that I think is where we start in circuit breaking, uh, getting off a busyness wagon. So I'm going to suggest to you that, because um, you've already missed your first, although you, you could be now, I'm part of your first two hours today, but I'm going to suggest to you, do your day today as best you can, and then at about four o'clock this afternoon, stop. Take stock of what you're doing, review your Kanban of where what needs to be done and by who, and think about um, what are the tasks you need to do tomorrow and over the next two weeks and categorise them according to uh, intensity and um, impact. Now, the, the good thing about doing it in terms of intensity and impact is we don't get caught up by the urgency. So with, whilst I love and we all stand on the shoulders, all of us who work in productivity stand on the shoulders of the late, great Stephen Covey, um, his, his urgency stuff has kind of become a bit religious in, in the sense that everyone is always urgent all the time. Everything is considered urgent all the time. It's, it's like a, I don't know, it's not really a religion. You know what I mean? It's just, it's a way of life. But when we think about um, intensity, what's going to require a bit of brain power for me means that I'm going to work at the time and get the things done in the time that is, uh, that is it's a bit more powerful. And it means urgent things that could be small but urgent but don't require much brain power, but urgent, can be done later in the day. And so I'd really love you to start challenging this because um, when you start working differently in this way around thinking about intensity and how much brain power do I use versus urgency, and which is usually someone else's urgency, um, you just start to work at a calmer level. And that's what I want for everyone. I want everyone to work in an effortless, frictionless way. So the tool I'm sharing with you today that gives you that, in fact, normally, normally, people would pay a lot of money to get hold of the first two hours productivity system, which basically kind of talks about everything I'm doing here. It has, um, it has uh, habit trackers, which is the tool you got first up. It has planners at the beginning around thinking about what you want to do and the things that create the most impact for you. And it also has um, what I call your, I use these, so some people use them over a day, I use them over a week. So I set up my, my week according to um, what has to happen. What are the, the things I want to do in the first two hours this week here and things that go into all the other ones as well. Now, what I like about this, it's rare that I have downtime, rare. And I reckon it's rare that anyone has 100% downtime in that you've absolutely got nothing to do. It's, it's rare that anyone would sit at their desk and go, wow, I've completely caught up on everything. I have nothing to do. Um, but every now and then, 
I will catch myself in a moment like, right, what, what am I meant to be doing next? What, what should I be doing next? And I look down and if I've done that planning for the week, I check the clock, what time is it? And I have a look and see what are the things that are in the time zone that I should be doing. And that's easy. And then I just do those. And so it helps me because, again, don't forget, I've taken everything out of my brain. I don't have to remember what it is I'm meant to be doing next because I either have it written down um, or I've got a big long list. I've wiped the mind. If you don't want to be highly structured in that way, you just wipe your mind with a list of things. But I have all that stuff out of my head. It's okay not to remember what I'm meant to be doing next. I think that's a great place to be because it means you've captured it effectively in your, in your notes pages. So the tool that you get today, whoops, that's not the one, that's the one. <laughs> the tool that you get today are, the, the, are the, the, what I think are the important pages from this book or from this journal. So you're going to get a, a page that's called Start the Week Off Right and it's like what are the three big things you really want to get done this week? And then what are some habits you want to track this week? So for me, I sometimes put things in here like, I want to make sure I go for a 20-minute walk every day. I want to make sure I'm drinking, you know, three or four litres of um, water every day. And I want to just habit track that. And if you want to use um, your, ha your habit tracker that you got on day one, that would be useful for that. So you get that page. Then you get um, the spread for the week, which gives you the... Um, the whole two weeks on a spread, and then you get a notes page at the end. Uh, and the notes page at the end is, is just useful if you need to jot things down. For me, I often use that when I'm preparing for a meeting or taking notes for a meeting. But the thing at the bottom is really useful. I like to give myself a weekly score. Yeah, maybe I'm just a score kind of gal. I like to give myself a score at the end. How did my week go? Was it a, was it a 10 out of 10 week? I got everything done that I hoped. It was super productive. I'm buzzed and I'm feeling really energised. That gets me a 10 out of 10. Um, I might get an 8 out of 10 if I got a lot of stuff done, but I'm feeling tired. I got a little bit caught up in some of the weeds at some point, so I don't feel as energised. Um, this week I'd probably give myself, gosh, on the one hand I want to give myself a 10 out of 10 because I've managed to drag myself out of bed and do my do my lives and do a few webinars this week despite being a bit laid up with a, with a, with a head cold. And you'll be pleased to know I've got my COVID test back and I'm all clear. It's just a, um, a virus, so just a non-COVID non virus. Um, so I'd probably give myself a 2 out of 10 in terms of the energy I'm feeling, but I'm going to give myself a 10 because I've already showed up every day doing the, doing the thing. So I reckon uh, that it, that's a, a worthwhile score for me. So that's the tools for today. I'm, I'm just going to come back to you now fully on the screen and say this has been a bit of a mini example of the work that I do uh, with individuals and teams in, in organisations. I help them get off the cycles where they feel like they're, you know, like a, like a hamster in a wheel. And I'm expanding this challenge towards the end of July. We're kicking off on the 27th of July. And we're going to do a six week habit builder challenge. And this is where we're going to spend six weeks because I know people say it takes about 21 days to make or break a habit. And I'm gonna say yay to that. And I'm going to say in the busyness of our world, I think when those kind of statistics were created, and, and that's, a, that's a long time ago, that's back in the 60s that people were talking about 21 days to make and break a habit. Um, and anyone who has tried to make consistent habits, you'll probably find it does take a bit longer than 21 days. And given the, um, probably the, the breadth of the work that we do, we can't focus on one thing for 21 days because that's just the way life is. So over six weeks, we're going to choose two or three habits we want to get into. I'm going to be sharing with you other productivity tools and how to build habits and draw and curate information for you around what creates, what we need to do to create good habits. And we're going to set ourselves up so that at the end of six weeks, we are, look, will we solve every problem in the world in six weeks? I'm not sure. I mean, I'm curious to find out. Um, but certainly we'll be on track to having life and work by design, where we're doing work in the way that we feel like we're under control, where we've got our life in a place where we're not overwhelmed and feeling like we're being pulled from pillar to post, where everyone wants a piece of me, and that we're, we're not at risk of failing at the important things. Because here's the thing that I worry about for lots of us who are on this cycle, is that we're, we're not yet failing at things that we know of. Um, but I do worry at some point that if we're not getting a few things sorted out and getting our ducks in a row, 
our health may suffer. Our, um, you know, our kids may not feel like they're getting the best of us. Our partners may not feel like they're getting the best of us. Um, even the hobbies that we do, even like our, our true inner self doesn't feel like it's getting the best of us. Um, and that's what I call when I say failing at the important things. We've got to start just getting on top of those things. So it's been my absolute pleasure spending these few weeks with you. I'll be posting about the 27th, um, the kicking off with the, um, the Habit Builder. If you would like to know more about it, just put a comment in the comments. Please tell me more um, and, I'll be, uh, and I'll respond to that. I'll be going back to having a look at who's viewed it and I'll be reaching out to a few of you anyway about this, uh, who, who people who've been on for the week. And it'll be all over my socials. Um, and so looking forward to welcoming you if you want to come to the, the Habit Tracker, um, or sorry, the Habit Builder, uh, a six week challenge and um, I'll see you then. In the meantime, uh, take care and continue to use all these tools so that you're able to get off that wagon and get onto a really positive, productive cycle. See you.